Um, anyway, so yeah, mapping equations. So we can we can start with a form that's sort of easily recognizable as something we can map. Um, so in this case, we have a form that you can sort of directly write into the K-map itself. So for example, we have A and B and C. We could say, okay, that one goes there. A and B and C complement, one goes there. And B complement and C complement. Um, so you're given that equation. You can map it, and we can say, yeah, well, the simplified version is just to have two groups of two, um, where this group is representing A and C complement, and this group is representing A and B. Um, therefore, the simplified version is A and B ordered with A and C complement. Um, so there we go from equation to K-map back to equation. Potentially, or most likely, the equation won't be in such a blatantly obvious form where we've just written out each min term. Um, what you may have, it's already written in a somewhat grouped form, um, but not the most simplified. So again, I've drawn the K-map out with all of the min terms written. Um, so assuming we either have the equation in or can get it to a form similar to this, so we, we have sum of product, um, what you can do is, starting with this first um, literal here, A, M, B, N, C, and D complement, this is uh, fairly obvious. This is the case where we just have a single square, for example. So you can find the square, and this, if you don't have these written out, you can say, okay, A is 1, B is 1, C is 1, D is 0. Um, so 1, 1, 1, 0 would be here. Um, for the second term, what we have is there's only three variables in it. So there's no D. Um, and what this means is that, for example, A is 1, B is 0, C is 1, and then um, that literal covers the case where D is 0 and D is 1. Um, so for example, we say A and B is 0, 1, so 0, 1. C is 1, so in both these cases C is 1. Um, and we don't care what D is, because it's not in the term. So then we have 1, 1 there. Finally, um, this one, B complement and C complement, we know that means B is 0, C is 0, and D, we don't care. It's both 1 and 0 for what we're going to consider. And A, again, isn't in this, so we don't care about it. Um, so where is B 0? B is 0 in this column and B is 0 in this column. Uh, where is C 0? C is 0 here. C is 0 here. So we know that what this is representing is sort of the intersection of that you can think it of. Um, so then we've again mapped from equation to the K-map. Once we're in the K-map form, uh, we can simplify it further. So we can form a group of two here. Um, a group of four here, and another group of four here. Uh, so that group of four, we'll call this three, two, one. This group of four is actually the exact same as the original. We didn't simplify that any further. Um, but number two here, because we grouped the original thing we were given, um, only considered contained two elements. So we've expanded that to four elements, meaning that this now becomes, so if this one is B complement and C complement, um, number two here, these four, become A and B complement. We've eliminated C um, from that literal. And then finally this one, which was originally just a single square, and you can see there's four variables, um, we've eliminated one variable from it, so slightly simplified it. So you can see we've eliminated B, so it becomes A and C and D complement. Um, so the final simplification is just the OR of those three. So again, here we've gone from equation to K-map. Uh, once you're in K-map form, you can simplify back to equation. So it is much faster, basically, than going through all of the logic identities. Um, 
And that's all I'm going to cover about minimization by mapping. Um, so again, you, the objective is to first get the equation in a form you can map it, minimize it with a k-map, and then write the equation back down. Obviously here I'm using all sum of product form. Um, if it's easier, you can get the equation into product of sum form and then map it using the zeros and write it out again. The second thing to talk about today uh, is the idea of NAND and NOR conversions. So we started working a bit with NAND NOR conversions, and this is basically um, where we had seen De Morgan's Law. Um, and that's where we're going from NAND NOR in the Boolean algebra. So there's a bit of an easier way when we're dealing with circuits to think of it and to go through it, and I'll sort of show that now. Um, and why we might want to do this is that, as I've said before, the most simple gates to physically implement in a chip are NAND gates and NOR gates. So here a NOR gate is only using um, four MOSFETs or four, or four FETs, sorry, so four elements. Um, to use an AND gate, we actually use six because we add, at the end of this, we add an inverter. Um, so if we can use NAND gates, it will give us sort of the simplest representation. So if we want an AND gate, we actually have to use more elements than if we want a NAND gate. Similarly, if we want a NOR gate, again, it's only four FETs. To create an OR gate, we have to invert the output. Um, so when you go to realize circuits in a chip, there's an advantage to trying to generate it with NAND or NOR gates. Um, and if you use all of one gate, all NAND gates, for example, as I said before, it's simple because you just put down tons of NAND gates and interconnect them. So you can sort of use the same general structure and just by interconnecting NAND gates, make whatever you want. Um, so to do this, there's a few equivalencies we'll be using. Um, and you can, you can show these through a number of ways. You can look at the truth table if you want. Um, you can look at the basic Boolean algebra. Um, so, for example, these, this identity here is sort of the classic, one of the classic ways of writing De Morgan's. Um, this is the other one. So in the identity sheet, those two are written. And the ones above and below it are just the case where we've had to add additional inversions. Um, but you can see, based on this, we can convert from either a standard OR gate to a NAND gate with some extra inverters at the input, um, or from a standard AND gate to the case where we have extra inverters at the input, or vice versa. So the simplest way of explaining it is with a very basic example. Say we had this schematic, and we want to implement it entirely with NAND gates, nothing else but NAND gates. Um, so we would draw the schematic, and we might say, for example, this is input A, this is input B, output Y, and I don't know, say that's C. So we have three inputs there, and one of them, you might assume one's a complement, so say this was a, a complement, I don't know. Um, so say you had just written that directly from a Boolean equation. So we use this list of equivalencies, oops, um, and you first replace all of the AND gates with NAND gates. So to replace the AND gates with NAND gates, all you do is you draw a little circle here, as you can see, so one circle there. Um, but we obviously need to invert this again somewhere, or else we've ruined the whole circuit. It's no longer the same. Um, so we add another inversion at the input of the, you know, the next gate, in this case the OR gate. Or if it was an output, you add a NOT gate somewhere. So the point is you convert from AND to NAND, but keep the circuit the same. In the same way, um, we convert the OR gates to NAND gates. Um, so from that table, before what I had said is that an OR gate is equivalent to a NAND gate um, with the inputs inverted. So something like that. And again, we're using those little circles to mean inversion. Um, 
So when I have an OR gate with one input already inverted, I just add another circle at this point in time, and you just you stack a bunch of them together. That's how it ends up. Um, step four is then you go through and say, well, obviously, if these two circles are together, the inverters are canceling. Um, so I just have a regular input. And you can go through and you might have that in a bunch of cases. Anywhere you don't have this canceling, so for the other input, um, and again, remember this was A, B, C, and Y, you have to add a NOT gate. Um, so here I'm making a NOT gate from a NAND gate because we just want pure NAND gates. A, B, C, I'll put Y. Um, and there you go. So that's a very simple way to convert from anything to pure NAND gates. If you want to convert to pure NOR gates, um, you can do effectively the exact same type of procedure, except converting everything to the NOR form. Um, again, that original list of conversion shows how everything works. Um, so now what we'll be talking about is um, we'll be talking about the time response of gates as well as some of the um, resulting sort of aspects of that and problems that will come up with the time response of gates. So when we have been showing the time response of a gate, like as in this, um, diagram here, for example, take a NOT gate. I've said the output is just the inverted uh, input. So when the output is zero, the input zero, the output's one, vice versa. And it instantaneously changes. In real life, you can probably guess this isn't the case. So there's a bit of delay. So what happens is that the, the input zero, um, and even once the input changes to one, the output doesn't actually reflect that for some very small period of time um, because physically it takes time for this to switch. So when you look at a data sheet for any part, I picked um, one of the 7400 series here, we'll see, it'll tell you, so this is the inputs um, and this is the outputs. So it's saying that when the input changes, there is this what they call TP, um, so it's this time delay through the gate. Um, and there will be some additional time delays. For example, when we're going, the input's going from low to high, there's a specific time delay. When the input goes from high to low, there's a different time delay. For everything we'll consider, we'll just call it a single delay of data passing through this, and that's all we'll care about. Um, to give you an idea of what typical values might be, I have a few data sheets pulled out. So this is the, the 7400 device, which is a NAND gate. Um, is a NAND gate. So from the data sheet, you can see there's a whole bunch of different values you might be given. Um, so here we have the propagation delay. And again, there's different values depending on which way the waveform is switching, but they're very similar. Um, so at 5 volts, 25 degrees Celsius, you can see it's, you know, around 4-ish nanoseconds. Um, for a different device, so the same 7400, but a different technology, you might have different values. So for the LS, we're talking here about maximum of 15 nanoseconds. Um, for this HC device, it's saying potentially up to 135 nanoseconds. Uh, so it's a bit slower in this case. And why you have these huge variances is, is um, it's cut off in the diagram here, but this is saying from, you know, minus 40 degrees Celsius to plus 85. Um, so over temperature you'll get huge variances. We can use those gate delays for legitimate useful reasons. Um, the first is what we call a pulse shaper. So the pulse shaper here, uh, you can see I have this input A, and then this output Y. So if we go through and analyze that, what you would say is you would say, okay, there's a odd number of NOT gates. So this input here is equivalent to A NOT. Um, and then what I have here is I've implemented Y equals A and A NOT, which 
seems stupid because we know that that should be zero from the logic identities. But in reality, because the gate delays, it's not the case. So say, for example, at the input A here, um, if I draw some input pulse, um, the input B will be the inverted version of this, except delayed a tiny bit. So I'm going to delay it by one of these the grid units here. Um, so you can see it's delayed there. The input C is the inverted version of that, again, delayed slightly. Um, so we're back to the regular. And it's three units long. Um, and at D, finally, we get, again, inverted, but delayed even more. Um, sorry, it's kind of messy. Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. Let me erase that. Um, so in reality, the point D is this inverted. Um, it is the same. It's the A invert, but it's been delayed by, in this case, three of the inverter delays. So one, two, three. Um, and then when you get the final and of this, what you get is D and B, or A and D goes there. Um, so what you'll see is that it's zero. Um, and then it goes to 1 for a little bit. Uh, where does it end? Go to 1 for a bit. And then... Uh, where is it? And then down. Um, let's just see. Just want to make sure I've drawn this right. To right there, to right there. Um, okay, so what you were expecting to get was um, you were expecting to see a zero at the output, but we actually see this pulse at the output. Um, and if the pulse had been extended, so say you just kept the input high, I never even dropped it low. Um, what you would actually see is that this pulse will always just be the three units long. No matter how long the input pulse is, as long as it's three or more units. Um, so we call this a pulse shaper because for any input pulse longer than some minimum, the output's always the same three unit length. Um, so we've used the gate delays as a way of generating some sort of dynamic circuit here. Another thing we'll use gate delays for is what we call a ring oscillator. Um, so in a similar way, we have an odd number of not gates connected together. And um, again, what you will see is that the output here, what you might expect to just you know, do nothing, will actually be a square wave, um, something like that. So again, you can look, say, if A started um, it's down here, when high, at this point, um, at B, again, you'll see this um, delay here, and I, I won't go through the full example with this one. Um, and then at D, we get the inverted version. So at this point, um, we can say that this feeds back to this input. D is actually feeding back to A. Um, so D and A should really be the same. So we ignore sort of this tail. Um, at this point, A goes low because D went low. Um, but now D is driving B with a bit of a delay. 
and it goes high, and you can sort of see how this is continuing. Um, and so you'll get this oscillation pattern. So we can just use a bunch of gates connected together to generate what they call a ring oscillator, because um, it looks like a ring. And if you add more gates, it's obviously going to extend this time here. Um, and it will give you a lower frequency. So you know, if you have 100 gates in a row, it will oscillate with a lower frequency than just 3, or I guess 101. You always need an odd number of gates. Um, So, although we can find a use for them, the gate delays also give us problems. The problems take the form of what we call glitches. So, say if I have this circuit here, and I have a 1 here and a 1 here. Um, and say the input, we have 1 there, 1 there. And say the input was 0, um, so B is 0, which you would expect gives you a 0 here, 1 here, 1 here. Zero here, so the output's one. Um, now, if I change this input to one, what's going to happen? First of all, a one will go here, um, so we'll get a one output there. That be expected, but and here, from zero to one, we'll get a zero here, um, and this will go to zero. And then we we're expecting it still to be a one output. So that's what we want to happen. But because of this gate delay, what might happen here, because of this added delay, um, you might get sort of unexpected results because there'll be some intermediate. Um, so for example, if I, one second, zero to one, there. So what you might get, for example, is that um, there'll be some intermediate state that it actually goes to zero in between, going to one. Um, so what you might have is something like this at the output. And there's this tiny glitch um, that shouldn't be happening. And this glitch happens for only a single bit input change. Um, so only one single bit has changed, nothing else, and yet we still have this potential for a glitch to happen here. So this is obviously very bad because before I had the example of the gray coding where we were counting a binary and we have many bits changing at once and if many of the bits are changing we know that there may be some unintended consequences because the bits don't change at the same time. But here I'm saying, even though a single bit is changing, there's some unintended results. Um, and, you know, for example, if this was, I don't know, like detonation system or something, um, you know, connected to fireworks or whatever, if you have this, this is bad, because it could set something off long before it's supposed to. So if there's a potential for this glitch to happen, the, circuit, the circuits have a hazard. Um, so what we are trying to achieve is hazard-free circuits. So a hazard-free circuit is one that has no potential for the glitch to happen. And we have to have a way of knowing if this could potentially happen or not. And we're doing this in sort of a theoretical way to give us the, um, the greatest sort of relief, the greatest ability to say under no circumstances with this circuit, no matter how the gate delays might change, create a hazard. Um, because as I showed before, the gate delays can change a huge amount. So on a circuit board, some chips might be at a different temperature than others, different voltages, and you can't predict reliably how exactly the gate, gate delays will be. So we have a few types of hazards. We'll call them a static one hazard. You can see where it's supposed to be one, um, but it glitches to zero. Static zero hazard, uh, it's supposed to be zero, but there's a hazard in the zero state that it goes to one for a second. And what we call a dynamic hazard, where it changes a few times. So here it's going from zero to one, and you can say it goes up and then down before finally arriving. Um, dynamic hazards are created only when we have several levels 
um, so higher than two level, you know, of logic. Um, because each of the gate delays through the different levels, well, I guess that is two level. I need to add something else. Um, each of the gate delays through different levels might differ. So in this example, we have these two input single A and B are going through two levels of logic. C is just going through one level of logic to reach here. And D doesn't go through any logic to reach this point. So as each of these adds delay, you might have um, different hazards added between the two levels, and the final output will have this dynamic hazard that changes multiple ways. So it's critical to remember when we talk about hazards, that's a single bit variable change only. Um, so only when one single input is changing. So to find hazards, we use the KMAX unit. So these make it fairly easy to consider what is a hazard, where might they occur. So looking at this original circuit I had here, if we draw out the formula for it, we can see it's A anded with B. Um, so we have A and B, and then it's ORed with B complement anded with C. Uh, so that's it written in formula form. So from here, we can use that same idea of the equations mapping to write um, the potential ones or the ones into the K-map and the grouping we're using. So A and B, you see what is this group? Um, so A and B, we can see is here. So there's two ones there, and it encompasses both of them. B complement and C, um, we can see is this group here. So that's the K-map as written for that equation. So where the hazards occur is that when we have a single bit change and we go from a, the same product term, so when or we go from the same, not product term, sorry, the same um, output. So in this case, we're expecting the output to be 1. In this case, we're expecting the output to be 1. But when we go from here to here, um, we're actually switching the product terms and we're switching sort of what there's nothing that encompasses both of them so because we have this we have two unconnected terms there's a hazard in the circuit because this has the potential to create a glitch um, so to fix it what you need to do is basically be wasteful and add an extra term that encompasses everything so I add this extra term here, um, and to create the hazard-free form, you encompass both of those potential, that potential glitch in its own product term. So when it's switching um, between the two, it's always, you can think of it as force to a specific state. So when you look at it, um, you can sort of imagine it being that it's switching between these two states, and in the process of switching, it'll generate this undesired or unknown state. If we force it to a specific state, it makes it safe and makes it hazard-free. Um, so this term, you can see, is A and C. So to create the hazard-free format, um, we can just say it's plus A and C. And that would be the hazard-free form. And you can draw it out like this, and you can see we've added an extra gate to make it hazard-free. Um, so now we're guaranteed that in that same situation, 1, 1, going from 1 to 0, the output will be a constant 1 and won't um, change. And you can sort of see from the circuit how we've done that, is we've explicitly made it so that the output here is dependent on A and C. Um, here... So that even though this, we can't rely on sort of this state here to create the constant output, this one is in that case. So when it's switching, it's still encompassed by this term and is thus hazard-free. Um, um, like, let me just clear all this. So 
that's okay because say you mean if we had like one 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 say. So there's no hazards in this because when you, so this is not that anymore. Um, say if you had grouped these together and these together, there's no adjacent product terms that are, um, there's no adjacent product terms, so there's no hazard because when we go from, when a single variable changes in this case, we're always going to zero. And we go from a one to a zero, we assume there's no dynamic hazard because it's a two level network. Um, so when you go from one to zero, you're safe in this case. No, because it's going, the output's going like that. So to generate a hazard in this sort of case, you would have to have something like um, that. And that's a dynamic hazard. So to generate this, you need more than two levels of logic. Um, it's it's just not possible because we only have sort of the two the two possible. Let me get us. So we only have the two possible something. If what sir? It should still be fine as long as as long as it's always two levels. So for example, I could have a three input gate here. Something like that. Uh, so yeah, if you have more than two levels, then you'll have the issue of dynamic hazards. So we'll talk about those, how to eliminate those later, um, because that's more complicated. And when you do this, when you eliminate the hazard that way, um, you can also assume there's no static zero hazard. You can go through and prove that if you want. Um, but if, yeah, so if you remove the static one hazards, the static zero hazards have also been removed. Um, and when we have two level networks like this, you can also say the dynamic hazards are removed. So it's only for two level networks that we'll do this simplified form where we check um, the product terms and find any of them that are adjacent but with no sh nothing shared between them. Um, so for multi-level hazards, how we deal with it is we have to use basic Boolean laws to get it to a two-level form. Um, so if you have any sort of multi-level circuit, you have to simplify it down or expand it, depending on which way you want to think of it, um, to get it into a form that we can just write on the k-maps directly. When you're doing this, you have to be careful because you can't use complement laws or any of the simplification laws derived from it. So this is to say you can't assume um, A and A0 is equal to 0 or A or A0 is equal to 1. Uh, you can't use those because using those would mean that you can introduce hazards. Um, because as we had said before, some of the hazards come about because we have, for example, if you have a switch situation like that, um, even though by the laws the output is zero, what you'll actually see is that there'll be a slight glitch because this inverter is adding a delay. Um, so for example, if you have a zero here, or if you had a one here, um, this one, so if you're going from zero to one, this will be one first, and this uh, will actually still be one for a brief period before going to zero, even when the input here has already reached one. So if you use those laws, you'll introduce problems. Um, so once you have it in a form, you use the k-map, and in the exact same way, you derive the hazard-free form. And for now, we're just going to leave it in a two-level form. We're not going to convert it back, um, because when we have these multiple levels, when we have these multiple levels, um, we can introduce dynamic hazards, and it's more difficult to remove those using sort of simple form. So we just keep it in the two-level form. Um, so as an example, say if you had this, what you would do is you would just distribute it. Um, so again, we can see it's multi-level because if you were to draw this out, we would have three-input AND gate. 
A, B, C. Um, and this is the first one. And then we have A or D. Um, a complement word with C. So we can see we have more than two levels involved here. Um, because in this case, we have the three levels. So this is a multi-level circuit. So to convert it, all we'll do is use the distributive laws here. Um, so you'll have A and B and C plus A and A complement um, plus A and C complement plus D and A complement plus D and C complement. So again, we don't simplify it down any further, so we just keep it exactly as written with the distributive laws. So we don't use the fact that this should actually be zero. <coughs> Oops. Um, and then from this form, we just map it into the, or write it into the K-map. So, um, this is what I had simplified before, rewritten there. Um, so we just go through A and B and C. So you can say A is 1, B is 1, C is 1. So this case is the bottom two here. So this is term 1. Um, term 2, we won't actually draw on the map uh, because... You can see it's A and A complement, so we're saying A is 1 and A is 0. Um, so we'll ignore that one for now. Term 3, A is 1, C is 0. So A is 1 here and here. Um, and C is 0 in this one, so this whole term is number 3. Um, number 4. C is 1, A is 0. So this whole term here um, and finally we have D and C complement. So D is 0 and or D is 1, C is 0. So 0 C is 0 here, D is 1 here, so it's that whole row. Um, so then we'll say OK. So that's 5. So where we have potential hazards are anywhere that we have a change of product term um, with the output still being 1, so these adjacent points. So we'll have, for example, let me draw a different color. Um, yep, yeah, there's two. So you can notice going from here to here is a hazard um, because nothing there's nothing involved in here. So you can actually say specifically where will the hazards come up. So for example, um, this input is one one zero one. So going from one one zero one to 1, 1, 1, or actually no, there's three hazards, sorry, is one hazard. Um, another hazard is when we're going from this state here, 0, 1, 1, 1, again to 1, 1, 1. Um, and a final hazard is, you'll notice, again, the wraparound you have to be careful of. So when we're going from 1, 1, 0, 0 up to here, 1, 1, 1, 0. Is another possible hazard. No, so like because you mean here, or between here and yeah. here? Uh, no, because I you assume it sort of wraps around in this case. I believe, yeah. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I'll triple check that afterwards, but um, just to, so we have 1101, 1111. So those are sort of the potential hazard spots. So to remove them, um, you just have to add some sort of additional terms. And again, you want to make them as big as possible to make everything as simplified as possible. So let's say we add, um, we could add a whole line here. Um, and this line would eliminate the hazards here and going around. And um, you know, you could add another term, perhaps these four, yeah. So again, you can't add any additional ones, so you always have to be where you're already covering, but you want to make sure you have all the overlap you need. So in this case, I've added these additional product terms six and seven here. Um, so you can see six is just equal to A and B, because A and B is one, one, and seven, um, is equal to B being 1 and D. And that would be the hazard free form from that original multi level um, network. Pardon? Yeah, so then you would just, and we would just write. Uh, yep, as as written, I would just leave everything basically. Um, so that's actually all the material for today. I'll go over a quick review from the beginning. Um, so at the beginning, we talked about the idea of mapping equations, which is just that instead of mapping. Uh, where all the ones are in the truth table, you can map, for example, you could start with min terms and um, map these directly. So you could say A and B and C and B and C naught and B naught and C is one. And then you could have a simplified form. Uh, more likely, you'll have the case where there's some level of simplification already performed or maybe not simplification, but it's not in such an obvious form. And this might mean, for example, that you have to expand or do some sort of simplification or manipulation of the equation you're given to get to a form representing this, so a um, sum of products form. So again, in this example, we could say A and B and C and D naught um, would be here. A and B naught and C would cover these two, um, and then B naught and C would cover four, so we can look at where is everything B naught and C naught um, would be there. So then you can say, uh, well, we can simplify this because we can make that one big group, that one big group, and then the group of four stays. Um, in a similar way, you can just simplify sort of any equation. And then to NOR conversions, uh, all we do is there's sort of a procedure written out, and we'll use these to convert from whatever into either pure NAND or pure NOR. So, for example, to convert to pure NAND, we draw the schematic, um, and you just convert all the AND gates to NAND gates first, and then you have to complement the variable somewhere further downstream. Um, OR gates, using those conversion tables shown, you can convert them to NAND gates with all the inputs complemented. So again, here I just stack two inverts on the input. Um, and then you eliminate double inversions, if that's the same, and add any additional inverters as needed. Same way to do NOR gates. You just use, obviously, instead of converting to NAND, everything's converting to NOR. Time responsive gates, gates naturally have some time delay involved in them processing the data. Um, that time delay 
will depend on a lot of things, depend on what the gate's made of um, in terms of the technology. So here I'm showing various uh, gate families, and we can see that the delays vary by quite a bit. So here we were talking four nanoseconds, typical. Here we're talking, you know, depending on the voltage, from 25 to 7, typical. Um, here we're talking 9 or 10, typical. We can use gate delays for a bunch of stuff. One of them is the pulse shaper, where um, no matter what the input pulse delay is like, for example, the output is always going to be this certain delay pulse. In this case, I have a three-unit delay pulse. Um, and again, this is showing that although we expect the output to be zero, because that's the equation I've just implemented, in reality it's not. Um, so gate delays mean we can't always just directly apply all the Boolean algebra we've known about. Similar way, we have what we call a ring oscillator. Um, so we have just a bunch of not gates connected together. And because of the gate delays, and because I have an odd number of gates, this only works with odd numbers, um, we'll actually get a square wave output. So we'll get this oscillating output. Gate delays give us problems because they mean that we can have glitches. Um, so in the example I had, the simplest example is to consider... Um, Consider again this, where you expect the output to always be, in fact, zero, but as we showed before, it wouldn't be, um, because this not gate will delay the data potentially. So if we originally had this as zero, um, what you'll see is zeros here, zeros here, ones here. If we then change that to one, basically instantly this input will change to one, it's just a wire, but this input will have an additional delay due to that not gate. So it'll be one for a little bit longer and then go to zero. Um, so we expect the output to be zero, but in reality the output jumps to one for a brief instant. Um, and this glitch is for a single variable change only. So in this example I've given, if only B changes, we could have a glitch here. If only this A input is changing, we have a glitch. And if there's a potential to have a glitch in the circuit, that circuit has a hazard because you might get a glitch at you know, some point. Um, a static one hazard means that we expect the output to be one, it drops to zero. A static zero hazard means we expect the output to be zero the entire time, it glitches to one before going back. Um, dynamic hazards are when we're changing um, several times. So here we have the example, the output's going from zero to one. We have a dynamic hazard because it goes to one, then back to zero, then to one. Uh, you generate dynamic hazards only if we have multi-level, as in three or more levels of uh, gates. So, you know, something like this. Um, because each of those... Each of those levels will add some additional delay. Um, so something like that could have a dynamic hazard, right? May not, I don't know, I'm just having an example. So single bit changes only. To analyze them, all we do is we figure out um, if there's product terms when you draw on the K-map. So here we have A and B is one, um, B not and C is the other. And when we move from here to here, we expect the output to stay one, because both of those are one. But there's no product term explicitly forcing it to one during that transition, so we may get a glitch. To avoid a glitch, um, you have to add an additional product term that covers both of those states. So in this case, this would be hazard-free now um, because what we've done is added this additional term here such that it encompasses the transition. Um, there's no other risks of glitch because everywhere else, for example, we're going from one to zero. Um, so we don't care about those states because we can't have a glitch in the two-level implementations we're using. So the hazard-free form adds additional logic that creates um, a glitch-free output. 
So when we were doing this, we were actually always, throughout the whole lecture, using the example of ones. Um, you can imagine in a very similar way, so if I had the same, same equation written, um, we could write the zeros. So again, this would be, instead of the sum of products form, if I have the zeros, it's effectively the product of some form. Um, so you can analyze it and say, is there any uh, zero hazards? So for example, if we had that, um, in this case, we'd have the same idea. There may be a zero hazard moving from this term to this term. What you can show, uh, if you go through an example, is that by fixing the um, fixing the static one hazard, you'll also have fixed the static zero hazards. So in the sum of products form, adding this additional term here will result in the product of sum form also having an additional term that eliminates the static zero hazards. So for all we care about, just fix the static zeros, um, keep it to two levels, and it will call it safe. If we have multi-level hazards, this is where three or more levels of logic what you should do is use basic Boolean laws to get it to the two-level form so you can write it in the K-map and then proceed as before. Um, do not use the complement laws, so keep all those there, or a lot of the simplification laws that are derived from it. What this effectively means is you only really need to use the distributive principle. You should only need to for what we're doing. Um, so in this example, I distribute this and you get um, a two-level form here. We keep all of the terms, even ones we would normally eliminate, um, because as I showed, you can't use those complement laws. They can introduce hazards or glitches. So I had the example there. I simplified it to a two-level form, um, drawn the ones, and then add any necessary additional terms. So that's all the material for today. Any questions?